Could you imagine enacting nuclear revenge on your own family members? We'll get into that in a bit, but first, Bolly uses my friend to push illegal substances, so I get her arrested. During my freshman year of college, I, 21-year-old male, had a friend named Cole, 20-year-old male. He was a course mate of mine and he was a really cool guy, at least when you get to know him. On the outside, Cole was socially awkward. I know social awkwardness was a spectrum, and everyone had a bit of it, but Cole's was a special case. He couldn't speak to both guys and girls in public. He had the lowest self-esteem I've ever seen in a human. Whenever he tried to speak to someone, he froze up and choked on his words. It was hilarious. The day we started talking, I came late to class. I had woken up late due to the fact that I had stayed up the previous day watching a series. Every time I tried to say, okay, this is the last one, some kind of cliffhanger happened at the end of the episode, which made me have to watch the next episode. Before I knew it, it was 4am in the morning and when I slept, I woke up by 10am for a 10am class. I got to the class 30 minutes in and the class was already pretty full. The only seats that weren't taken were the ones at the back. Cole was the only one seated there. I went over to join him and asked for the notes he'd written down. He looked surprised by the fact that I was talking to him, but he said nothing. He passed me his note and I read through it and used it to make mine. By the end of the class, while everyone walked out, I went after Cole and thanked him for lending me his note. He only responded with an awkward smile. I tried to speak to him concerning the class, but he wasn't responding like someone that was interested in talking to me. For a brief moment, I thought he was being rude, but as I kept talking, I realized that it wasn't the case. He was just shy. At the end of the day, we parted ways and I went home, but the next day I got to class early. And while there were still seats in the front where I prefer to be, I looked to the back and, as expected, I saw Cole there seated alone. I walked over and sat with him. I talked to him throughout the entire class, even though he seldom responded. By the end of the day, he was starting to open up to me. He wasn't a very lively person, but there was something that drew me to him. It took some time, but eventually Cole started to return the same energy I put into our conversations. I had a lot of friends before Cole, but when we started hanging out, we became closer than I was with my other friends. Cole was quiet, yeah, but he was smart, deep, and fun to be around. I had an apartment outside campus in case that wasn't clear from my earlier statement, and most times he'd come over and we'd play some video games or chill. Cole stayed in university housing and he had a roommate who took advantage of the fact that he didn't complain a lot. He brought in loud friends who stank up the room with smoke and wouldn't leave till late at night. Because of this, I offered that he could come and stay with me. I had an extra closet where he could drop his stuff and the couch in the living room was a convertible bed. He agreed and just like that we started to live together. A few months along the line, Cole started to become more outgoing. There weren't any drastic changes and he wasn't talking to girls, but at least he could go out on his own and talk to guys and just have fun. It was really great to watch because it was all a result of the positive influence I had on him. One day, a friend invited me to some frat party on campus and I said yes. I invited Cole and we went together. I don't think I mentioned this, but Cole wasn't the best dresser. He could literally throw anything on and he was good to go. I found this funny and I never judged him for it, but that was just me. By the time we got to the party, I mingled with my friends and soon enough we were engrossed in discussion. Cole stayed close and we were having fun together. That was until a group of people walked into the frat house. I think they were jocks or something because the way people parted like the Red Sea for them made it pretty obvious that they were popular. I didn't know them though, but from the way Cole was frozen in place, I was sure that he did. As they walked past us, one of the girls in the group looked at him and said something rude about his outfit, and they all walked away laughing. I could tell that Cole felt bad, but he covered it well with a smile. We left the party soon after, but that was in our final encounter with the group of jerk jocks. Less than a week later, Cole and I were heading to the cafeteria when we saw them in the parking lot. That same girl who made fun of Cole's outfit at the party whistled as we walked past. We tried to ignore them, but one of the bigger guys threw a football at us. We had to duck to avoid being hit in the head. They walked over to us and further taunted Cole for his stress. I stood up for him and told them to back off. When they saw that I wasn't intimidated by them, they backed off and walked away. But still, that wasn't the end. The next day, Cole left class early while I was talking to some course mates, and when I walked out to find him, I saw him talking to the same girl who had been taunting his dressing. At first, I thought she was bullying him again, so I rushed over to help him, but when I got close enough, Cole told me that everything was fine and they were just talking. 
She left and we started to walk back to my place. I asked him what that was about and he said that she came over to apologize for how she behaved that day and she was looking to make it up to him. It felt suspicious to me, but Cole was sure that she meant no harm. I shrugged it off, thinking that was the end of it, but it wasn't. Another week later, while we were walking towards the cafeteria, a sleek sports car stopped in front of us. It was the girl who hung out with the bullies. She introduced herself to me as Aya and stretched her hand to me for a shake. When I ignored her, she faced Cole and asked him to hop in. I stepped in and said he wasn't going anywhere with her. She laughed and said that he could make his own decisions. Before I could speak again, Cole said it was fine and that he was going to go with her. I tried to reason with him, but he argued that he needed to know what she wanted with him. I had no choice but to agree and watch as he stepped into the car and they drove away. Later that night, when he came back with an excited look on his face, he told me that Aya took him to a club where the jocks hung out and they invited him to chill with them. According to him, they were nice, friendly, and apologetic about the day at the party. I wasn't buying it. The last time they were mean to him and all of a sudden they wanted to be friends with him. I told him about my concerns but once again, he said it was fine and they were cool. I could tell Cole was ignoring the facts because he wanted to be one of the gang. He had been an outcast for a long time and the slightest acceptance was making him blind to everything else. There was no way to convince who didn't want to be convinced so I let him be. Cole started to hang out with these guys every day and I started to see him less and less. He even stopped coming over to crash at my apartment after some time. One time I didn't even see him for one straight month during a school break. When I saw him in class one day, I noticed that something had changed. Cole had always been quiet and awkward, but this time he was quiet, awkward, and jumpy. He had a strange look in his eyes and he was constantly looking over his shoulder. I asked him what was going on and he said everything was fine. It was an obvious lie and I noticed that he was carrying a green fanny pack. He never carried a fanny pack, and when I reached out to examine it, he jerked away. When I asked him about his strange behavior, all he said was that he hadn't gotten enough sleep because he'd been staying with one of the guys in Aya's group, and they liked to party till morning. I found a way to convince him to stay in my place for the night, and he agreed. When he went to sleep that night, I searched the bag. Imagine my surprise when I discovered that it contained sachets of marijuana and other recreational drugs like Molly. I woke Cole up and confronted him about it. He broke down and cried as he told me the truth. After he had joined their group, Aya introduced him to some other guys who offered to make him rich. They recruited him to distribute drugs at a party. They said he was the perfect candidate because his looks and style of dressing made him look inconspicuous. It was supposed to be a one-time deal, but they kept giving him more drugs to distribute. The time he tried to quit, they threatened him and forced him to keep on doing their bidding. I was beyond outraged. How could they take advantage of him in such a manner? It was terrible. I'd never seen Cole looking so stressed and jumpy. I had to do something about it. I told him we had to get him out of their clutches, but Cole didn't want to. He was scared of Aya and her crew and what they'll do to him if they found out that he was trying to leave but I told him not to worry because he wasn't going to tell them anything. The next day, we went to the police and Cole told them everything, including the fact that he was coerced into distributing illegal drugs for them along with their threats to him if he refused. After issuing them our statements, we went back home. Cole had to keep in character, still distributing the rest of the drugs he had with him. When the police were ready, they asked for Cole's help. They told him to call Aya and the crew and inform them that he was coming to get more drugs to distribute. This was to ensure that they could catch them red-handed. Cole did as he was told and Aya asked him to meet them at their apartment. But instead of Cole showing up, the police did. They searched their apartment and recovered drugs worth thousands of dollars. Aya and her friends were immediately arrested and because of Cole's testimony, we were assured that they were going away for a long time. They would never be able to bother Cole ever again, which was exactly what we wanted. I just have to say, after all this, I hope Cole knows how lucky they are to have OP. OP had their back so many times, just from like coming out of their shell, to literally saving them from themselves from getting too mentally afraid of what these people would do. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy crazy stories of revenge, it would be amazing if you left a like or left a review if you're listening to my podcast.
That said, our next story is the experience I had with a babysitter. I'm a 22 year old female and I got married to the love of my life. Our love was one of a kind as we had to fight for our fairy tale. It was a fairy tale because we had lots of oppositions around us. Of such opposition were my parents who felt I should bag more degrees before I got married. I, on the other hand, believed I could have both. My dreams and, of course, a family. I met my husband during my 19th birthday. A couple of friends had thrown a surprise birthday dinner for me and he was one of the guests invited. To be honest, it was hard to notice anyone that night because it was my birthday and yeah, I was the center of attraction. But somehow, I managed to notice him across the table. It was easy because he wore a dazzling vintage shirt, and I remember tagging his style as tacky and looking at him weirdly. After the party, one of my friends introduced my husband and I to each other, and I can say that that was the beginning of a love story that would stand the test of time. When we got married, my husband and I were young, so we planned to take our time before we started to make babies. The plan was actually to enjoy ourselves to the fullest, but along the line, I fell in love with the idea of having babies early. My baby fever started when I saw a beautiful Caribbean lady whom I met at the grocery store. She had two little munchkins running around happily around the store, and she tried to call them to order. I was awestruck, and I think what was most endearing to me was how loudly the kids called her mummy with so much satisfaction in their voices. My husband, let's call him sweet, felt we should wait a while before making babies but I wanted to have babies immediately. At that point, he didn't understand why I had a sudden change of mind regarding babies, but all I knew was I couldn't wait to have mine. So yeah, I got pregnant in our second year of marriage, and I was the happiest woman in the whole world. When my bundle of happiness arrived, he was the most perfect baby I had ever seen. While I reveled in the joys of motherhood, I was also confronted with the reality of combining motherhood with my demanding career. I knew I had to find a balance because I was certain I didn't want to give up my career in the process. I was the girl who believed that I could have the life I wanted. After my maternity leave, it was obvious that I needed a babysitter to help with the upkeep of my baby anytime I didn't work from home. My babysitter, let's call her M, had the biggest smile I had ever seen in a woman. Her smile was not just big, it was equally beautiful. I immediately felt drawn towards her, and I praised God under my breath for sending her my way. You know, I was the type of woman who was big on first impressions. I used to believe in the energy I felt the first time I met someone. When I felt satisfied with who I felt my babysitter was, it was very easy to develop a bond with her. I was so happy that I felt fulfilled regarding my decision to have a baby. Seven months after employing my babysitter, I could go on vacations with my husband around the United States and even abroad without worrying about my baby. Before you wonder what sort of woman does that, I want you to know that I've watched my babysitter take very good care of my baby. I remember how many times I'd walked in on her and my baby unannounced and how each time I would see her either rocking my child or watching him sleep peacefully in his cot. I would go upstairs wondering how I got so lucky with my choices. I placed so much hype on my babysitter because I've heard so many stories about how some babysitters become terrible to the children they were employed to look after, and I would wonder why any reasonable human would want to inflict harm on a child. I couldn't wrap my head around such a nasty behavior. I remember a story my aunt recounted to me before I got married. She painted a gory picture of a babysitter who starved the child in his care until the child became sick. When he was asked why he did that, he claimed he did that to punish the child whenever the child gave him too much trouble. I remember feeling terrible and scared at the same time. I was sure that I wouldn't want such an experience for my child. So when I saw how well M took care of my baby at the beginning, I felt lucky. But I'd like to add that my babysitter was good, but she was not perfect. I remember when I caught her spanking my child gently when she wouldn't stop crying. To be honest, I'd never spanked my child before then, and I didn't know how to feel when I saw that. Just when I was about to react, I saw her swing my child up in the air, and the room was engulfed with so much laughter and joy. So I decided to let it slide. However, that was the first of many spanks that I would walk in on. I don't think it's wrong to spank a child, but I was sure I didn't want anyone spanking my infant. I couldn't pretend that I didn't see it the next time I noticed it, so I made it clear that I didn't appreciate such discipline on a child whose body is fragile. 
I could see the shock on her face as I noticed she didn't expect me to have walked in. She apologized and promised not to repeat such an act. Whenever I remember what happened thereafter, I usually wished I did what I was expected to have done the first time I noticed what she did to my child. I think one of my biggest weaknesses lies in giving people the benefit of the doubt. About a month later, I noticed a very strange mark on my baby's buttocks one day when I got home from work. It looked so scary because I hadn't noticed that before. I couldn't wait to see my babysitter the next day. I quickly gave her a call to inquire if my baby had a fall or something. To my surprise, she told me she had noticed the same too before she closed to the day. According to her, my baby might be reacting to a diaper. Strangely, I accepted the possibility of that because of how reddish and tender that part of his skin looked. I immediately got his diaper changed to another brand because I couldn't watch my baby wallow in discomfort and pain. However, barely three weeks later, I noticed that there was another strange mark on my baby's arm. Of course, my babysitter wouldn't dare say that my baby was reacting to a diaper at that point, so I asked her, and she managed to mutter to me that my baby must have had a scratch. At that point, I knew something unwholesome was going on, and I needed to act fast because my baby's well-being was involved. I confided in my husband, and I told him everything I had noticed. I could see from his countenance that he was sad, but he managed to act strong. He suggested that we get a CCTV installed without her knowledge so we can get a full glimpse of what was going on. I agreed to the suggestion and we got the CCTV installed the next week without her knowledge. Meanwhile, I had my heart in my boots all through the time. I couldn't concentrate at work because I feared that something bad was happening to my baby. I knew I could dismiss my babysitter without going through so much stress, but I was determined to do it in a just way even if I knew I was risking it all. Besides, I respected her a lot and I remembered the good times we'd spent together. Another day, I got back home, I began to inspect my baby's body. My heart broke as I did that, but I needed to be sure that there wasn't any strange mark anywhere or any reaction from a diaper. Thankfully, there was nothing to worry about and the CCTV camera didn't show us that there was any cause for alarm. But a few weeks after that, my baby fell sick on a weekend. I had gone out to the grocery store that morning when I got a call from my husband who had babysat our baby that morning. He sounded so frantic on the phone that I wondered what the emergency was all about. I left the store after paying for a few items as I couldn't waste any second. But then, my husband had taken our baby to the hospital for proper care. Upon examination, some marks were found on our baby's body that morning and I could feel goosebumps on my skin and so much heaviness in my heart. My baby's temperature was above 102 degrees, and I couldn't hold back the tears from my eyes. The doctor said my baby was reacting to shock. He admonished us to keep a closer eye on our child. We went back home in the evening with so much anxiety. I was literally in tears because I knew I could have acted faster to prevent such an occurrence. We checked the CCTV almost immediately after we got home, and I wasn't surprised at the gory picture that was displayed. It showed how my baby was crying probably because he was hungry and out of fury or maybe frustration, my babysitter had smacked my child's face so hard and we could see that his cries infuriated her the more. She suddenly threw him in anger back into his cot. My baby had let out a sharp cry which extended beyond 5 minutes. All the while, she went back to the food she was preparing for him before my baby interrupted her with his cries. Right from the day I saw her spank my son playfully, I knew I had a reason to be worried, but I allowed love and the habit of giving people many chances to becloud my reasoning. I felt so awful about the turnout of events, and I wished I'd done something earlier. As I watched the video, I couldn't stop the tears from trickling down my cheeks. I felt a cold shiver down my spine. I was nice to my babysitter, and I made sure I paid her much more than we bargained. For a split second, I could take her for my sister. How could she betray me that much? How could she comfortably abuse a poor baby who hadn't even taken his first step? I was sure she was a psychopath who needed to be remanded in prison for a while before being taken to a correctional center. I looked at my husband, and I could see the fury in his eyes. I knew too well that neither of us would push for forgiveness. 
We reported the incident to the police, and I made sure that my babysitter's picture was all over Instagram and Twitter, informing people of the havoc she had caused. At least, I was kind enough to save another household from pain. I found solace in the fact that I had ruined whatever ambition she had to hurt another child out there. I think what OP and their husband did here after being concerned honestly should be the staple go-to before any of this babysitter stuff happens. It probably is worth it and fair to disclose to them that there are cameras throughout the house, so you'll always see what's going on, but regardless, if you can swing the funding for something like that and have cameras in every room, make sure nothing fishy is going on, definitely the best policy in my eyes. This next story is, my little sister messed up my college application and I returned the favor years after. My family has always been small. At first it was just me and my parents, but this was years ago. A couple of years after I was born, they had my sister Tori, as she preferred to be called, rather than Victoria. We were happy, I believe. Mom was a stay-at-home parent and dad tried all he could to make sure we never felt the absence of mom's job. Our family was never something out of the ordinary. It was just your usual average sized home with two kids who couldn't be separated. Growing up with Victoria, one thing our parents always sang into our ears was the need to get into one of the best schools they could afford or with scholarships. This shaped a major part of my teenage years and senior year of high school. As the first child, I was supposed to be a model for my youngest sister. I could not afford to fall short of the pedestal my parents had placed me on. I had the grades for it since my grades were a bit below perfect. I had the right extracurricular to make any admissions officer think twice before rejecting my application. And I was looking forward to rejecting schools when I finally had to make a choice. To be fair, a part of me longed for it to be Howard. There, I could at least build on the legacy of my father, but I kept my options open regardless. Mine and Victoria's relationship was like your normal sibling relationship. We were there for each other when the other person needed, and we could stick our necks out for one another when the situation called for it. We bonded quite alright, but it wasn't like we were best friends. However, even with friends, there are certain things that you would never see coming. I used to believe Victoria was a cool sibling to have, but this was till she entered her rebellion phase at the start of high school. Mom thought it was the kind of friends she decided to keep to appear cool to others. I, on the other hand, thought it was just that phase we all get to engage in till we see how crazy things could turn from being rebellious. So I never gave it much thought. I just waited on the side till the time I believed she would come to her senses and see that we were still the family members she had had right from birth. But in the end, her rebellious phase and sudden disinterest in her family caused me to miss out on the most important things I'd looked forward to. The story starts when the time comes for university applications to begin. Some wanted an early acceptance into schools so they could commit and save their spot, but I did not. Not exactly. I immersed myself in the search for schools that would suit my taste and course of study. I accepted offers for online tours of the campus just to know the feel of it, and if I would feel at peace studying there, should I choose to apply or accept their offer. This whole idea came from my father. We pleaded that I do not forcefully try to continue in his legacy and choice of school if it wasn't the best fit. I narrowed my list based on renowned faculty, robust programs that aligned with my interests, and a campus culture I felt would be conducive to personal and academic growth. And I was down to five. I had three real options and the other two were to be backup options in case something goes wrong with the first three choices. I had it all planned out and I began the application process. I didn't mind the essays I had a right to apply to some of these schools. In fact, a couple of them were quiet essays to complete because they questioned the ideas and morals that I'd held close to my heart. I spoke from the heart, and I spoke using different words, different essays for each school. There was no overlap since I feared one school might reject my application for the same reason as the other did. Each document I typed was curated to speak of my achievements, aspirations, and unique qualities that would make them consider me as one of their best possible candidates. My personal statement underwent various edits to show my passion for learning and the distinctive attributes that set me apart from others. My GPA was the icing on the cake so I was pretty sure I could get in anywhere I applied to. I knew the deadline for each school's submission. They were on the calendar by the head of my bed, so I didn't miss out on any of them, and I noted them with different colors of sticker notes. When the application time for each one came, I submitted them. 
but this was way back when online submissions for applications was not as popular. And even when they came, people still wanted to do the mailing application submission. It seemed like a step you just want to take. That was the way I felt too. When it was time to apply for the schools I'd written to, I dropped the letter by the kitchen counter for mom to mail to me in her spare time that day. And I happily went on my way to school, thinking I was one more step from having numerous offers to choose from. But I could not have been more wrong. Day after day since I wrote the letters, and mom supposedly helped me to submit them, I waited for a reply from the schools. The mail was supposed to come at most two weeks after my application, so I waited. I got back from school each day, asking mom if the mail had come in and her reply was, soon. But that soon went on for more weeks than I could have expected and it finally dawned on me that not only was I not going to any of the colleges I applied to, but they didn't deem it fit to send me a rejection letter. Now, it was this latter part of the event that surprised me. I believe that, in the end, they would have been decent enough to send me a rejection mail. I received nothing and that was very unlikely. So one day, while I was on my way to school, thinking of the fact that I would have to deal with people talking about the number of offers they got and how confused they were about which to pick, I decided to take a U-turn from the road to school to the closest college that I'd applied to. This was where I got to know the real truth. There was this surge of anxiety that came over me when I got to the entrance of the school. I didn't know what to expect, and the fact that I could be embarrassed left a resounding fear in my mind. But I needed to put an end to the suspense as it had gone on for way too long. I navigated my way around and got to the admissions building. The receptionist greeted me with a polite smile, unaware of the storm brewing within me. I hesitated for a moment, the words catching in my throat before I mustered the courage to inquire about the fate of my application. Hello, how may I assist you? She asked, her fingers dancing over the keyboard. I explained the purpose of my unexpected visit. The receptionist's brows furrowed as she navigated through the system, seeking the information that would either shatter or salvage my dreams. But what she said next really shocked me and I remember her voice like it was yesterday. She said, I'm sorry, but it appears we have no record of an application from you because all applicants have gotten feedback from the admissions office. I would not lie, it felt like a dream. I was broken. Perhaps my reaction made her inform me of what she did next. She informed me that the opening to submit applications for those who were rejected closes in less than 24 hours, and I could make use of that allowance to submit mine. Eagerly, I went home knowing that I had one more shot to get into school that year with the rest of the class. I met mom at home, but as upset as I was, I refused to acknowledge her presence. I switched up my personal statement and made it more appropriate for the situation on the ground. This time, I took no chances with applying through the mail. I sent the application through their portal. When I was done, I stepped out to the living room to ask mom what happened to my application letters and if she'd gotten any reply. Mom, I implored, what happened to my applications? Are you sure they were sent out? Her reassuring smile faltered for a brief moment as she hesitated. Of course, sweetheart. I mailed them for you. Unsettled, I pressed further, my concern growing. Did anything unusual happen when you sent them? And she confessed to asking Tori to lend a hand to help put out the letters she had to mail that day. My application letters were on her to-do list for that day. That meant that Tori was the one who did the mailing. I proceeded to question her instead, asking her if she was certain that she helped mom send out my college applications. She met my gaze with feigned innocence and replied, Yeah, I dropped them off at the station. Why? Yet the pieces did not seem to align. The pieces of the puzzle didn't align. Mailed letters do not just happen to disappear midway. After I confronted her and with each passing moment, it became apparent that something had gone wrong with her mailing of my letters and she was refusing to admit her misdeed. However, I chose to be the bigger person, and I tried to move on. But despite my efforts to move forward, an unexpected shift in Tori's behavior caught my attention. She became excessively apologetic, offering remorse for the slightest mishaps or inconveniences. It was as if she carried the weight of a hidden secret, and her guilt manifested in the form of exaggerated remorse. This was what I hated the most. The fact that she knew she was guilty, was able to make apologies for other things but could not own up to the one thing I needed her to come clean about. Regardless, the time for college came and I moved to college. 
but I could not let go of the hurt from Tori's actions. I didn't know what happened, but I was sure she had something to do with why I was limited in my options and had to settle for the only university that was close by that I could turn to. It was the second of my two backup schools. As I settled into my new academic life, the proximity to home allowed frequent visits. During one such return, I learned of her ongoing college application process and everything came back to me afresh. The hurt, the pain, everything. This was coupled with the fact that I could not shred off the feeling that I could have gotten to a better school. Then one day, out of spite as I remembered my admission process, I went into Tori's room and found a list of schools she was interested in. I waited for her to send the application mail online, and I specifically emailed each of the schools pretending to be Tori. In each of the emails I sent, I was loud about their school being of a lower standard and I applied to them as backups. I told them that I'd gotten an offer from a better school and they need not deliberate on my application. After I was done, I deleted everything that could be traced back to me. Well, you could guess how that ended. There was no reply from all of her schools. Not even one of them thought to write back. And in some way, I felt fulfilled by returning that favor for what I know she did, even though I did not have any evidence. I just don't understand why they would do that to OP. Like, I don't know if they're jealous, they just don't want OP to do better in academics than them. But after all this, they kind of just screwed each other out of getting into any kind of great college that they wanted to get into. At least this year. I mean, I guess OP can still try to get in next year. But great, now you guys just screwed yourselves out of 365 days of academic progress. Of life progress. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.